unmuted. You're just too famous, Matt. That's all there is to it. <laughs> all right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, I'll just start by I recognize a number of your faces, but there's probably some new people as well. And um, I'll just say that I'm Skylar Wilson. And um, yeah, the inspiration for these meetings is to harness and, and connect our energies and, and be a support for the network that is not only the order of the sacred earth, but also the larger kind of um, what we feel and what we have um, kind of started this organization around is the impulse to be the best lovers and defenders of the earth that we can be. And um, that looks different for each of us. And, and it's an emergent creative process. And it's something that um, is a mystery as well. And so we're, we host these, these spaces as a place to support um, whatever that might look like for each of you, for each of us. And, um, and so it's a work in progress. It's us listening to the earth deeply and, um, and to ourselves and, and showing up without, um, without a sense of, uh, of what we should be doing or need to do, but, but more of like from a creative place of, of love and action and a place of, of strength that comes with with showing up and, and being our, our messy selves, our imperfect selves and having a space where that's that's allowed. And although this is only once a month, um, I have heard and, and seen over the four years that we've been doing this call that there's many ripples and like my, mycelial networks in which um, these connections go out in the world. And so, um, we're not holding this as a as a a class or anything like that, but we trust that there's wisdom in in holding an emergent kind of creative space. So um, that's kind of the gist, and um, many of you know this already. But um, let's just start with um, dropping in together. So welcome you to close your eyes or just find uh, find your breath, find your sense of um, groundedness wherever you are and just take a few deeper breaths. And just releasing anything that doesn't serve being present in this moment to this community, to the earth. And whenever you're ready, we'll all we'll come back and be here together. And Mariko is just re recovering from COVID. <laughs> oh. So we're happy to have you here, even though you're feeling um, still not quite 100%. Mm. Grateful to have you. Thanks, Kyler. Yeah. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm gonna invite Matthew to um, to, to share whatever's on your mind and then we're gonna open it up to the group. And so it's a, this is a space to share whatever is present that has to do with, um, with either your work in a pod or your local community work with the um, 
earth-centered connection, uh, whatever that means to you. Um, but Matthew, take us away. Oh, thank you, Sky the Art. And um, thank you all for being here. And thank you, Mariko. I'm sorry that you're still suffering from COVID. She says she's 80% herself yet, but it's been several weeks of, uh, of struggle. So I wish you well. <clears throat> um, what's on my mind is that today is uh, Walt Whitman's 163rd birthday. And um, when I think of the order of the sacred earth, I think of people like Whitman um, and what he represents in terms of the um, American psyche. Uh, not that there's not a shadow there, there is, but um, his effort, I think, to recall the sacredness of the earth, of the universe, um, as Thomas Berry says, ecology is functional cosmology, but he brings it all together. And just the title of his big work, Leaves of Grass, that um, he actually has a meditation on one, one uh, blade of grass. <laughs> and uh, he, he draws his whole, his whole epic poem out of that. So his, just there, there's such an invitation to not take a blade of grass for granted. And uh, he has a, he talks about the, um, how the, the universe is a writing, it's a poem for her, for him that he's uncovering. And that's exactly what Meister Eckhart said, that the um, creation, uh, everything in creation is a, a book about God and um, uh, is a book, any book about God. So, um, in Song of Myself, Whitman is saying that um, a creation as he experiences it is talking to him about God, it's revelation, uh, but he's got to decipher it. He has to listen deeply and so forth. He says, to me, the converging objects of the universe perpetually flow. All are written to me, and I must get what the writing means. So I just think he's a wonderful um, bard and um, nature mystic who is listening to the deepest lessons um, in our bodies. He loves to go on about our electric bodies. And of course, this is before electricity as we know it. So, I mean, that word electric was pretty virgin, virginal at that time, but, but it's real. I mean, that our, our bodies, he's so, he's so busy trying to undo the fundamentalism of the Puritans. He really, that's really his agenda to undo the first Christians who landed on the soil and went after the indigenous people and made the big dualism between soul and body and between nature and, and grace. And so he's trying to undo all that. These are battles we're still fighting. And, um, but he did it in many ways well, I was going to say alone, but of course he wasn't alone. He had Emerson and others, but he went further than most of the others. And of course, Emily Dickinson is in the same camp with him that um, uh, she too is trying to undo dualistic religion in favor of um, our recovering the sacred in nature itself. So uh, in one of my favorite books on Whitman, done by a friend of mine, Stephen Herman, a uh, union analyst, Walt Whitman, Shamanism, Spiritual Democracy, and the World Soul. I want to share with you just a few things that, that um, Herman makes in his uh, conclusion of the book. Um, that uh, I love this line. Um, the, uh, the, the previous religion from Cotton Mather and so forth in America were horribly dualistic as their myth-making was based on a fundamental split in the Judeo-Christian psyche that Emerson and Whitman sought to heal by becoming trans-religious, cosmic, and universal. Trans-religious, cosmic, and universal. Because Whitman was calling for what I call deep ecumenism. He was calling forth the wisdom of all the world religions. And, um, and what um, Steve calls, um, uh, spiritual democracy, that democracy is a loving of the playing field 
and that um, we ought to wake up as a species and find that there's wisdom in all the religions of the world and you know kind of quit making war uh, as a result. And um, uh, he, I just love that phrase of transnational and trans uh, religious. Um, that was his, his big vision. And uh, I think it's still our vision today. Um, and he talks about how, of course, the Puritans were very, what I'd say, patriarchal. But he says, um, both Dickinson and Whitman were poet shamans in dialogue with their bi-erotic soul. And of course, both of them were gay. With an archetype of wisdom, the mother of all, that spoke to him, to Whitman, from an ancient matriarchal region of the psyche, from the psych psychoid or shamanistic ground of being. So Herman really believes that, that um, what well, Whitman was shamanistic, and he has that great line about um, beating the um, um, snake uh, skin drum. And this was his, his poetry was beating that drum, creating a rhythm, creating a rhythm, a vocalism, a practice a through poetry, through beat. And of course, today, I think rap is that kind of beat too. It's very uh, shamanistic. It's based on a drum. Uh, and of course, all poetry in some way taps into that. But um, I just think it's, it's appropriate for a group uh, of um, people who want to love Mother Earth to call in uh, this bard, uh, Walt Whitman, on his 163rd birthday. I think he has a lot to uh, share with us. And so I, I wanted to kick off saying something along those lines. And I invite you to go back to him because, you know, we go through my, at least I go through phases in my life where I like poets, this poet at this time and this poet at that time. Because I read Whitman when I was very young originally. But um, I think he's come to mean more to me now that uh, we're facing more of the demise of Mother Earth and um, that we need this level of the shaman poet to get to our guts, to get underneath all the prattle and the political uh, positioning to get to what's really at stake here, that there is something um, uh, sacred about the revelations that come to us through nature and uh, this is ultimately what we're trying to preserve. And as Thomas Aquinas says, the first and primary meaning of salvation is to pre preserve things in the good. And I think Whitman was trying to do that 160 years ago. And um, we're, we're about that today too. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> it, it reminds me of, um, my friend Jorge Ferrer, who's written about the um, participatory turn in, in spirituality. It reminds me of spiritual democracy in the sense that, um, that there's no, there's no um, ultimate, I mean, there are, there are some things that work better than others as far as um, spiritual paths for certain people, but there's no um, defined ultimate that it's a participatory process where we come into relationship with spirit, with life, with the earth, and that um, we each have our own um, way of doing that. And so it's a good, um, Whitman's such a good example of that, the way he was so turned on and, um, and gave himself so completely to that connection with life to the earth. Um, thanks for the reminder. And so um, whatever that inspires in you today, um, mm -hmm. it's an open um, circle. And so, um, Please speak from the heart, listen from the heart, be here, be present. Um, and um, if we could keep our sharings to, um, to two minutes, um, I think that would be great because then we might have time to circle back on some of the, the themes that emerge. Um, so with that, we're, we're open and um, yeah, it's great to be here with all of you. So please feel free to use that two minutes to share from the heart. Um, well, I'll just start because I've never been here before. I'm brand new. 
and I'm honored to be here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, as I heard um, Matthew speaking, I was thinking of Mary Oliver and uh, how the earth and the sacred beauty of the earth was her salvation. And if she were alive today and, and Whitman were alive, I'm wondering what they might say to one another and what they might write for today. So that was the question going through my mind as I was listening. Where are you from? Where are you speaking from? Uh, Hi, I'm from uh, Connecticut. Connecticut, oh, welcome. Yeah, I used to be up in, in P-Town when Mary Oliver was, God bless her, alive. Uh, yeah, no, I, I love that connection, Mary Oliver and about women. And yeah, I'd love to be a fly in the wall for that conversation. <laughs> Maybe yeah. you create one, be a dramatist and, and make it up. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it would be fun to be. What a thought. As it for, why not? Okay. <laughs> Go for it. I, oh, oh Margaret, please, go please go ahead. Well, I was going to say, since I'm unmuted anyway, um, yeah, I was saying I moved and it was to stop climbing stairs, mainly for my knees, but I cannot tell you how happy I am and how, how it's helped my heart to be on the ground, to be on grass and the pond and see the ducklings, seven little ducks, and mama is trying to teach them how to dive and she keeps going down and they don't have a clue. I think they'll get it eventually, but um, she's, is, you know, she keeps on. And uh, there's a lovely white egret came to welcome me. I've called her Sylvia. She comes daily. And um, it's just, you know, I'm very old. It's just made me a new life. So I'm so grateful. Oh, and of course, we're working with the monarchs in uh, trying to entice the monarchs in DuPage County. And a friend loans me a, a small patch of garden and uh, I'm planting milkweed and, you know, trying to make a milk, uh, a, a monarch garden. So that's gardening is my focus at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I'll just share a little bit um, and I'm just grateful to be here and in and, and community. And um, I mean, this is, I, I got COVID early this month um, and I'm sort of experienced, like trying to look at it through the lens of this like, sort of spiritual, um, yeah, just a very spiritual, like relating to it in a spiritual way. Um, I'm in my fifth week and I, I, I'm struggling with words. I've got pretty bad brain fog, um, which has been a, a little bit annoying to overcome. Um, but through it, like, I feel like I've gotten actually closer to the earth. Like I'm, I'm feeling things on a deeper level. Um, in the, the two weeks I was very sick, I kind of came out of it and then into this like chaotic world of um, where we were seeing like issues, like the reproductive rights, like the Roe versus Wade stuff. Um, the, the seasons changed in Vermont. It was like completely bare, bare trees. Um, and then sort of, sort of lying in my bed, watching the world go from, from very bare to, to totally full lush alive. And here I was in my bed, unable to do anything. And, um, and then we had two really, you know, horrible act like gun violence and, and tragedies and sort of kind of going 
waking up into that world um, was a huge shock for me. Um, and since then, I've kind of gotten this renewed like spiritual energy to try to transform myself in alignment with that, um, you know, kind of coming back to health, but really slowing down and listening to my body and getting back to the earth and um, just trusting that process. And so I don't really have any answers or questions or anything like that, but just wanted to share that. Um, and if anybody has questions around COVID experience, I've, I've made some, some friends through this process that are navigating the long COVID experience and that's that's been challenging um but my heart is full to be here with you all tonight uh, so thank you for being here uh joanne and i visit the juno uh, detention center in dodge county wisconsin uh, it's the uh, detention center for uh, immigrant Im immigrants that are being detained until they are deported. Uh, sometimes it's quite a while that they have to stay there. Uh, we were informed by the immigrants that we talked to that they haven't been outside for over five or six months. They haven't seen, uh, haven't had a breath of fresh air. Uh, this is right in, of course, in the um, time of the beautiful spring here in Wisconsin. Uh, it, it was, we've experienced quite a bit of uh, injustice um, at these detention centers, but this seemed to be especially vicious. Uh, so uh, this is something that we will protest. Do others know about that, uh, Bill? Uh, we are, are, are with other people that go to the uh, detention center. Mm -hmm. So we uh, are uh, we're a, really a separate group from a group in Chicago that we started with. Uh, and so, yes, there are others that know about it, but we're uh, kind of somewhat isolated in this and that um, we don't know where to go with it, but we're starting, we're going to do something with it. The head of the detention center is, uh, you'd think in Dodge County, it'd be Matt Dillon. No, it's uh, uh, Corporal, uh, what's his name? Marvin. Corporal Marvin is the head of the detention center. Mm -hmm. So we're asking for a meeting with uh, Corporal Marvin. Where we go from here, I don't know. We just don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. How about the press? We get some journalists. Yeah, that's a good idea, and we haven't done that. Yeah. And of course, with an election coming up, maybe you get you won't get Ron Johnson on your team, but maybe <laughs> uh, the other guy, <laughs> right? Yes. Um, get it into the political discussion like that you know thank you yes we do know somebody that's uh, running for uh, senator in ron johnson's uh, seat well we've met him he he's um someone that we worked with we had a group called the faith community for worker justice uh -huh. and he was with uh, uh another group called what was that the um interfaith interfaith committee for um Greater Milwaukee, but anyway, we we did meet with him, so we do have somewhat of a connection there. The, the problem is that by federal law, um, inmates, all inmates in federal holding, um, must have an opportunity for recreation, but that's within the discretion of the local um, directors, and this jail happens to be a county jail that took in federal prisoners who are the immigrants. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And they have never had any space within the building for any inmates to smell fresh air, to be outside. Mm -hmm. Whereas other more modern um, detention centers have a built-in patio for people to walk out of the building, but still be within uh, mm -hmm. a secure area. So this building was never built for that mm -hmm. idea. It was supposed to be a jail where people come and stay a short time and um, went out and- In my bail. chair, I'll just turn my camera off. So um, it's a conflict between federal rules and county resources. I'd like to share with Phil and Joanne that I also am involved with visiting immigrants in detention. So the, the organization that I work with is called Casa de Paz in Colorado. And it might be helpful to just look up their website and you can see all that we've been doing through the years. Um, the, our visitation was stopped when the uh, COVID started, but just now they're opening up again. And I found visiting them extremely thrilling, just really, really thrilling. To me, it was literally like visiting Jesus in the disguise of an immigrant. And um, I'm, I'm bi bilingual and bicultural because I was raised in Mexico. So I, you know, mostly would visit um, the ones who, who had no friends in, in Colorado, no relatives and no English to speak and uh, with. And so we would have a great time. We, you know, we're separated by a piece of glass. Is that how it is with you guys? You visit, you're separated, um, you, you talk with a phone. No, we are fortunate enough to sit at a table. Oh, face. yeah, we, did, we, we, we didn't have that. And um, so sometimes myself and the other person across the mirror, we would sing. <laughs> One guy I visited, you know, he, he was a musician. So we would sing uh, songs that I knew that I was raised with. And what I liked about the separating glass was that he couldn't hear my voice because I sing very much out of tune. <laughs> and so we would ha have a lot of fun and, um, when I could, I would go to their court hearings. And sometimes, most of the time, I'd be the only one there to support them. And you can imagine how fearful that must be for them, especially when they don't speak English. So, so I just embrace your efforts on their behalf. I'm so happy to know that, that you're doing that. Thank you. The organization that started this visiting is in Chicago and it's called the Interfaith Coalition for Detained Immigrants. Mm -hmm. And they have just recently decided that their resources are not sufficient to do or to sponsor or to organize the, the detention visiting. So the fact that we're doing this on our own, a group in Wisconsin, um, is interesting. We don't have the power of this nonprofit organization in Chicago to speak for our concerns. So we have to speak from our own hearts and use our own energy. We can't depend on them to speak uh, for this need. Um, it's good and it's bad, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Um, what's, like I said, you might enjoy visiting Casa de Paz because we provide uh, housing for people when they're released. We are there on the days of their release so that when they are released, they come immediately into our arms. In fact, we come, we come there with the food. So that as soon as they get out, we provide them with food in the van and, and clothes. And uh, our house, Casa de Paz is very close. It was bought intentionally to be very close. Sarah Jackson is the founder. And she has an amazing story. So, and then, then what we do is we uh, immediately buy them tickets for wherever they want to go. 
So, and we will have people ready to take them either to the airport, the train station or the bus station. So, I mean, they can stay overnight with us, but we try to get them on their way as quickly as we can so that they can be with their uh, relatives and family members. That's fabulous. That's marvelous. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll chime in here because I'm also from Colorado and this is my first time participating in this group. So Crystal, I think I definitely wanna connect with you on what you're, what you're doing. I, um, I, I was out in the desert for 11 days um, a month ago and I kind of got this hit that I should be doing work with refugees. <laughs> um, so I've been, just starting to connect with a couple of different uh, refugee groups in, in the Denver area. Um, just, you know, I'm scheduled to go to their orientations and so on. Um, so I haven't actually done any work yet, but um, what you're doing is really, really powerful. Um, and, I, um, and I was just thinking about, uh, I was at the Spiritual Directors International Conference in Santa Fe a couple of weeks ago and Father Greg Boyle, um, who runs Homeboy Industries in LA, talked. And he talked about this, um, sort of the, I'm distilling this obviously <laughs> down to a sentence, but you know, part of the secret sauce or the secret sauce of the success of that group, of that effort is people are seen for the first time mm. like you know yeah there's all the tactics and all the stuff they do but really people walk in and they feel seen for the first time so I've, I've been sort of thinking about that and making even though I'm not you know that's not my lineage it obviously doesn't matter what faith tradition that comes from but um but sort of really kind of making that a, a, a principle or a way to try to be in the world. Yeah. And that goes for the more than human world as well as people. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Michael and um... I, I live in Los Angeles, and uh, in 20, June 2020, here the San Gabriel's were on fire, and the sky filled with ash. And I think we were without sunlight for three or four or five days. We had to keep our doors shut, windows shut. This was during pre-vax COVID, and the homelessness in the streets surged. It was really bad helicopters constantly overhead, sirens all, all around, and guys detonating M80s in the street. It was, you know, ungood, double plus ungood. And coming out of that, recovering from that, I, I learned about the preferential option for the poor and the preferential option for the earth. And I didn't know those terms before, but they resonated with me because of what I experienced, like uh, raging wildfire produced by climate change and then the related um, uh, poverty and homelessness. So that uh, had a transformative effect on me, like kind of a conversion. So I still don't know what I'm doing, but I'm trying to figure it out. So I've been fortunate. I pitched. I'm going to invite everyone to something with that in mind so you know a little, about, a little bit about where I'm coming from. I'd like to invite everyone to a book discussion group that um, I've, I'm fortunate to help organize with a group called the Association of U.S. Catholic Priests. And I've just been like, as part of my quest, been studying uh, Vatican II with these people. They're retired priests, and some of them are Catholic worker priests. Um, 
some of them have had um, adverse experiences with the Vatican, stuff like that. So they've agreed to host a book discussion with a um, professor from Italy, whose name is Massimo Borghese. He's a professor of moral philosophy. And um, he has a book called Catholic Discordance, Neoconservativism versus the Field Hospital of Pope Francis. And the Pope Francis part of the book is beautiful and inspiring. Um, and uh, it, it's kind of cool actually how Pope Francis is dealing with the reality of the world we live in. And this is all, of course, in the context of, uh, of, of sacredness and nature and creation. But the other part, the neoconservative part, is very disturbing. And I did not enjoy reading the 100 pages. But, um, you know, it's, it's worth reading because there's a, a lot of powerful people in the world, especially the United States, who have an ideology that says that God is present in the market and nature will... Um, produce what the market needs, sort of on behalf of God. It's insane, but this is driving a lot of environmental um, crisis. So I'm gonna put the info in the chat. And if anybody's interested, you can sign up on the, um, the, the uh, Catholic Priest website and you can send me an email and I'll send you a copy of the PDF, the book in PDF and take it from there. Thanks for listening and sorry for talking too much. Hey everyone, I'm Will McGarvey. I live in Benicia. I do a lot of my work in Contra Costa with the Interfaith Council of Contra Costa and our Interfaith Climate Action Network there is where I do a lot of my advocacy work. Um, but I do a lot of my um, spirituality through Presbyterian and pagan circles. And um, recently it came out that the local refinery has um, had not been being tracked for some of their emissions and that they've been leaking benzene, a cancer causing agent for the last 15 years without the knowledge of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. It's about a mile away from my house. Um, so I've just been doing some of my own calming work uh, as well as talking to neighbors to see if any of them are experiencing anything because this is, pretty serious amount of, of uh, pollution that they hadn't been tracking and just decided not to tell, even though their refinery was much like others. And it took the others, other refineries doing their work for Backman to recognize that this refinery had the same stuff going on. So pollution kills, you know, fossil fuel pollution kills 10 million people a year. We don't often think of it that way, but it does. And, um, so just thinking about that and those that live even closer, uh, more downwind, more downwind, uh, folks as well. So those are some of the things that I'm thinking of these days.
I'm not sure if everybody's had a chance to speak yet. I came late. I'd love to hear from you, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've just been uh, excited here because um, for a couple of years, there's a group called the U Mountain Center and U Y E W for the U Pine. Um, and we've been, we had uh, received some grant money to start a little school for outdoor education, not outdoor education, but hands on environmental ecological education that will primarily take place outside. <laughs> it's not adventures, it's about science. But um, anyway, it's a 500 acre uh, plant preserve uh, uh, sanctuary um, for medicinal plants in Appalachia. And um, we just uh, realizing the uh, fragile ecosystem that everybody lives in. Um, but the fact that we are very rural and have been minimally impacted by all of the extractive industries in West Virginia, um, yet the um, appreciation for that is not apparent. Um, and we have a really unique situation of Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of very clean, fresh water, um, the headwaters of a lot of rivers. Um, so we just began to believe that the most important thing we could do was to start educating our little communities um, about what a gift it is to live where we live um, so that it wouldn't have to be so much of an emphasis on the um, fighting back against things, but just a natural appreciation so that it would be just a very uh, built into your system. And again, I always uh, mention Matthew because uh, the awe schools, <laughs> you know, I found awe inspiring. So um, we are, again, arts and uh, just the wonder of nature, and the, the bounty that we, 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 where we live, get to enjoy. So, thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Margaret. Can you post something like a website or something that we can um, track or direct people to support that? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, it, since the school is new, the U School falls under the U Mountain Center as one of the little tabs, um, but I'll, I'll put that here, our link. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And it's Great work. sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. So we're very excited. <laughs> I did a, um, I worked, uh, I did an AmeriCorps position when I was in my early 20s um, in West Virginia in um, Mingo County. Oh. And it was, um, it was called the Big Laurel Learning Center, was where we did, and it was an ecology center. Um, the Web of Life Ecology Center, and we worked with that age group as well, high school and middle school, but also reaching out to the surrounding communities and going and protesting and talking to the, the coal companies and, mm -hmm. and the other activists who were, um, who had direct experience with getting like the, the sludge coming down the mountain and, you know, like literally filling up their entire houses. Like yes. the impacts to the environment and, and people are just insane. So um, yeah, so great work. I have a personal connection to that. And, and, and that's, you know, we're not in that area of our state. So, um, it, you know, we are, again, we are, we've been very fortunate, but um, I did want to speak to, I think it was Will who talked about um, the pollution. There's a movie called Dark Waters. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with it, um, but it's about the um, toxic pollution in West Virginia rivers. Um, and it, it might be inspired, well, it will be, <laughs> it, it's a very sad story, but, you know, victorious in the end after 20 some years of fighting, you know, a legal battle. But um, uh, Mark Ruffalo, you know, played in it. Um, and it's really well done. And I think sometimes uh, 
when people can watch something like a film that's a story, um, it can be more, in, you know, more quickly inspired to react and respond. So um, it might be something for people who are in particular situations with those kinds of corporate polluters. Um, it's very eye-opening, very disenchanting, very disheartening, but gets the message across pretty clearly. <laughs> um, what did you say the name of the little learning center was? The Laurel, Big Laurel, Little Laurel? Laurel Big Laurel Learning Center, okay. yeah. And it's, it's run by a couple um, nuns through the, um, I think, Notre Dame, Notre Dame, okay. Notre Dame is the, the, the nun order that they're part of. Do you think they're still there? Yes, I think they are. Yeah. Wow. Great. Yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Has anybody that hasn't shared, um, would they be interested in sharing? I, I feel bad because I've already shared once before, uh, but I'll share again. Um, so part of my healing, I've been really drawn to water um, and I've been looking at Crystal's background at the, with the waterfall. Um, and I've been doing a pilgrimage. Um, I actually converted the back of my car with a futon because I get very fatigued, but I know that being in nature will heal me. So instead of just being limited to like my tiny radius around my, my house, I've been sort of driving and then <laughs> sleeping in the back of my car um, and making a, a waterfall pilgrimage. Um, so it started in Vermont and I've kind of made my way down. I was in New York over the weekend and I visited um, the Catterskill Falls. Um, incredible um just like just wow um and so I was just thinking of what people were sharing about home and place and water and healing and just um appreciation for what is in nature um it's just the, the appreciation that makes the preciousness that much more concrete and um I think I'm looking at these experiences with new eyes and i I'd love if, uh, you know, just to hear if people have things that they've made pilgrimages for. I know we've only got a little bit of time, but, you know, just think about taking the vow and, and being alive and promises that we make to the earth. And, and if maybe there are ways that people are doing that in this time.
I think that's a great story about pilgrimages to water places and um, other sacred places. Uh, there's this photographer in Canada named Courtney Milne, M-I-L-N-E. And make a long story short, he, he had a revelation one night. He was looking at the moon in the middle of the night. He got up from bed and a voice said to him that he should um, go on a pilgrimage around the world to all the sacred sites of the world. So he did this and he produced a big, beautiful book. And uh, I have it in the next room. But, um, and, and that might have been, I don't know, 25 years ago. And I, I knew him because he called me and he, he said that he, he had this mystical experience. He never had something like this happen to him before. And he picked up, he went to a, a bookstore, learn, and he picked up my book on the cosmic Christ. He said it really spoke to him. So he took my book with him on all these places. And he went everywhere. And all his photography equipment was stolen when he was in China and he had all these adventures. But, um, but then, you know, like the rest of us, he aged and uh, his health wasn't real good. So the last years of his life, he didn't go anywhere. Instead, he photographed water in his backyard. He had a swimming pool, but he kind of let it go. So all these things grew in it. And he, he took like 40,000 pictures of his, in his backyard. And uh, he said it was just as holy and just as sacred as all these great temples and places that he visited and, and you know, other um, sacred nature places. He said he didn't focus on things that humans built, but he had some of that in there. Mostly he focused on nature's sacred places. But I thought that whole journey of his, and now he's deceased, uh, but his wife still has a wonderful web page up. And he's become quite famous in Canada. There's a whole, uh, he, he left a lot of his photographs to the city where he lives and everything. So you, you can look up his, him up and these wonderful photographs and uh, teachings because he was something of a poet too. He, he wrote about what these meant to him. But again, the, for me, the bottom line was because he asked about a lot, he had this, this old swimming pool in the backyard that no one used. But he, he took 40,000 pictures and he said every day it was different. Every day, depending on the sun and the clouds and the weather and everything else, there's nothing boring there at all. And uh, so you can find the sacredness in nature, he said, either by pilgrimaging outwards while you're young <laughs> or staying at home. So it was a, it, it's a marvelous story and a, and a beautiful uh, book. And again, go online because they've, uh, his wife has put up a lot of these photographs with his uh, little, very brief teachings under each one of them. Uh, so, but uh, to me, your story triggers his story. So. so may I just add to that? Because he also, I mean, it posts, you can get a newsletter version of it so that one of these comes each day, which is oh. one of the things that's showing up every day for me. Oh. And you can just click on that picture Mm -hmm. and have the writing about it there. Mm -hmm. well, I'm glad you know him <laughs> and his work. <clears throat> Amazing. Will you share that link, Anita? I, I don't know. Courtney Milne something, you know. Oh, okay. yeah. M-I-L-N-E. Right. You'll find him. It's Canadian. <clears throat> The idea of pilgrimage, when I turned 50, I decided I was going to do some kind of a pilgrimage every year and to water places. And uh, I think I did that five times. <laughs> uh, and then I'm not sure. Well, I do know what happened. Donald Trump got elected. That's what happened. <laughs> and all of my passion for living. <laughs> but um I, it's that's an interesting story about staying at home because this year I just um, decided to uh, stop mowing. Oh, we have a lot of grass and I said, I'm just not gonna mow grass. Um, and I cut like a little circle for a meditation circle. And just to watch the meadow now uh, is just like going on a pilgrimage because I just was out cutting some flowers. And I couldn't believe the variety of grasses 
I was like, oh my gosh, this is just amazing. So I kind of count that just walking in the big circle. That's that I'm I'm like your friend. It's like I'm I'm not gonna pilgrimage far from home, but I'm gonna pilgrimage around my yard. <laughs> and it is very delightful. Well, thank thank you all. I, I, I felt that theme of um, of feeling the sacred in the um, not the ordinary, but the close to home like that. That's a theme that I've been with today as well. And um, I'm really glad that that came up and uh, out of the silence. Also, um, grateful for the long periods of silence today. Um, I know it can be uncomfortable. I can sometimes feel a little bit of like, oh, I should be managing this or organizing something, but I really have come to appreciate us all being together in silence. And um, it's kind of a, I, it's a practice that the Quakers and Buddhists and others um, practice where um, you just are, you, you are together. And then whatever comes out of that is even more authentic and more um, connected than if we were to jump quickly and try to make something entertaining. So. Thank you all for being with us in that way and um, and for being with the kind of um, nonlinear aspects of this of this group in this this time. It, it's nourishing for me at least. So hopefully it is for you as well. So thank you all and may these um, does anyone feel like they want to send us out with something? Send us out with a blessing, a prayer. We all could do do something. Um, I'll open it up to everyone and I'll just say, I'm sending this out to all the beings, especially those that are in pain, suffering and sending love, understanding, connection. So feel free to send out your, your blessings either silently or to the group right now. I want to send my my blessings to the person who smashed my window and stole something from my car. I'm very, very concerned and uh, wish him I wish him the best. Here's a short poem from Wendell Berry. At start of spring, I open a trench in the ground. I put into it the winter's accumulation of paper, pages I do not want to read again, useless words, fragments, errors. And I put into it the contents of the outhouse, light of the sun, growth of the ground, finished with one of their journeys. To the sky, to the wind then, and to the faithful trees, I confess my sins that I have not been happy enough, considering my good luck, have listened to too much noise, have been inattentive to wonders, have lusted after praise. And then upon the gathered refuse of mind and body, I close the trench, folding shut again the dark, the deathless earth. Beneath that seal, the old escapes into the new. Oh, thank you all. Be well. Be well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.